But uh, I got a shot in my right knee on Wednesday of last week, and uh, I hurt my left knee <laughs> on Thursday afternoon. And that's why, Gary, I wasn't reluctant to say, yes, I'll come and preach. You may have noticed a little solid in my voice. I said, I don't know that I'll be able to stand and do it. But it's gotten worse, seemingly. But uh, there ain't nothing wrong with my mind and nothing wrong with my heart and my mouth is still working. So <laughs> you're, still, you're still getting to, to hear a lesson from God's Word this morning. And Gary called me and told me Friday, he said, I called Jim and he said, I've called Ron. He said, I've called, he named off some other people. And he said, and now I'm calling you. And I said, boy, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> I thought you could have just said I was your first call and get done with it. <laughs> but no, I, I do appreciate, I do appreciate the opportunity to be with you. New Harmony's always been a, an important uh, part of my life. Is this was, this was uh, where I spent a lot of time the past the several years. Um, when I was young and green, and y'all put up with me for a long time, uh, on the first and third Sunday, I believe it was, of the month, and uh, it's, been, it's been a fun time. I, I really enjoy being with you guys. We're going to spend most of our time this morning in the book of Philippians. And Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 2, there, there are three scripture, three places of scripture that I want to, to talk about this morning. And uh, I want to start in the middle point. We'll come back to it later. But there's a scripture I want to read to you to kind of get the, the thought across of what this lesson is going to be about. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That tells us that there is a standard by which we are to live our life by. There is a standard by which our thought process should be. There is a standard by which we should treat each other. And there is, how often do you read in the New Testament where the disciples, Paul specifically, and even Peter, but Jesus more specifically, prayed that they would be of the same mind, to be like-minded, to be of the same heart and of the same mind. How did Jesus pray His disciples would be one? We talked about that one this morning. How they would be one, as thou art in me and thou art in me. How that we can be the same as Jesus Christ as far as the mind is concerned. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we hear a, a different take on this, where it says, Be not conformed to this world, but are ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is accepted and perfect will of God. The fact that we can transform our mind, change our mind to be like Christ. There are three key elements. There are, there are more than I, that I could talk about this morning, but there are three that I'm going to talk about in regards to having the mind of Christ. What should be in our life and around our lives in regards to the mind of Christ? And the first thing that comes to mind is service. When you think of Jesus and the things that He did in His ministry in the three years that He worked in, in His ministry before His crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, we know that he went about from city to city doing a lot of good for a lot of people. There's nowhere that he went that he wasn't healing the sick, that he wasn't making the lame to walk, dumb to, he, dumb to speak, the blind to see, the, the deaf to hear. Those who had uh, various other ailments as far as sicknesses, he was able to heal them and bring them back to a, a good standing in health. And not only that, but how often do you see that when he went from city to city, there are people brought to him with with sins or with, with corruption in their life, and he basically passed forgiveness to them. He said, go and sin no more. Remember the woman taken in adultery? Now she was brought forward by those who were religious leaders of that time. It says she was taken in adultery. And the Bible tells us, or the word law tells us, that she's to be stoned. Well, the law also said that you have to bring both, male and female. So they knew they were convicted by their own self. And Jesus said, who is whoever is without sin? They didn't cast the first stone. That was why they all left, because they knew that taking a lot of context was a sin. They knew they were wrong. And the lady looks up and he says, Where's your those who condemn you? They've gone, they fled. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus was all about service. Jesus was all about doing those things 
that would help other people. And Paul echoes the same thought here in Philippians chapter 1, specifically in verse 21. When he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain." Now you may look at that and say, well, is Paul looking forward to dying? Well, as Christians, should we not be? And let's be honest. I mean, I, there are things to do on this earth, but Paul, Paul understood at this point, for me to live, what I'm going to do in this present world, what I'm going to do in this present life that God has blessed me with, I'm going to live as Christ. I'm going to do the things that Christ would have me to do. I'm going to serve. I'm going to live this life and do what Christ would compel me through His Word, through His inspired divine revelation, to be able to serve and do while I'm alive. But to die, man, look what's waiting on us. Look what's waiting on us. Same thing he told the church of Galatia in Galatians 2, in verse 20. You know, we sing the song sometimes at Bible camp, but it's one that kind of helps you to remember and memorize this verse, Galatians 2, and verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet my life of Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, in this present body, in this present life. I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if we have the mind of Christ, <coughs> service should come natural to us. And when we understand that Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, and the life he lives in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God, he understands that it's not no more Paul that lives anymore. It's Christ that lives in us. And there is a time that we as Christians have got to put ourselves away. We can't go through life hoping to reserve a portion of ourselves and not give God everything. That's not going to work. It never has and never will. <coughs> when you look at the sacrifice that Christ gave us, that is the second point uh, as far as the sacrifice. When you look at the sacrifice that Christ gave for us, what more could you possibly give than your entire life? Nothing. There's nothing else that you could give after your life. He gave it everything. What more could God give for us to gain salvation? Nothing. He gave it Himself. For God so loved the world that gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave His only Son. He gave of Himself so that we might live in sacrifice. And that's, just, that's what He echoes here in chapter 2. When, we're going to start verse 1 now. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill you my joy, here we go again, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. And he says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus gave everything he could to ensure that we could have a life in heaven. And friends, when we look at that sacrifice and that mind of Christ, so let's apply it to one thing at a time here. What is it then that we should give in return to God? Everything. If God is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. And if you can't put Christ and be a reflection of Christ, not just in your school, not just in your workplace, not just here at worship service, not just out in the grocery store, if Christ cannot be seen in you, then I have to question your Christianity. And I don't mean that to be ill-spirited. I don't mean that to be mean. I don't mean that to be rude. The only thing that I say is that if people can't tell that we are Christians by the way that we act and the way that we live and the way that we hold ourselves, then friends, we've got a problem. Because there's a lot of people in the world that, that claim all this. We mentioned that earlier. There's a lot of people in the world that claim Christianity, that claim Christ. Those that say, well, you know, he says, well, in Galatians 3, verse 27, it means you've been baptized into Christ to put on Christ. You go to McDonald's, you go to 
to Subway, you go to any other place of employment, you go to uh, even even the pharmacy where I work, you, we're, we're supposed to wear name tags to give us identification. And on that name tag, it's got my name, it's got my position, and it's got Stevens Pharmacy because it shows people that when they come in that pharmacy, they know that I work there. As if being behind the counter wasn't good enough. <laughs> But you go to a restaurant, they have name tags, identification. You go to Walmart, what do you look for? The people in the blue vest. And if you're lucky, you get a yellow vest. When you go to Cracker Barrel, what do you want on their apron? You want at least three stars, don't you? Because you know if you get that one star, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> or you know if you get that says future star, they ain't got the star yet. <laughs> you want that four star. You want that three or four star waiters or waiters. But you know because they've been the experience, they've gained experience, they've grown, they've, they've, they've got that, they just got it down. We look at all these identification factors in the world, we can tell us where people belong and what they were. If, if people were sitting here and they were wearing a, you know, a Taco Bell shirt and a Taco Bell hat, Taco Bell pants, you'd know where they were, wouldn't you? I mean, they wouldn't tell you I work at McDonald's. No, they have identification that he, you can tell where they're from. You can tell someone works in the medical field by what they wear and they see them in scrubs out there in Walmart and things like that. You can tell these things because you don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure it out. Now, if we can understand the concept of that, then how in the world can we not understand the concept of putting on Christ and letting people go out there and recognize us by the life that we live. And that's in word, that's in deed, that's in everything that we do. If Christ and God is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. And we can't sit there and say, that, well, we're going to sacrifice 80% of our life and reserve 20% unto ourselves. Don't work that way. And I would challenge you, those of you who have taken that step into marriage, let's pick on the ladies for a minute. If the man who got down on one knee or offered his heart to you in marriage and said, will you marry me? But, I'm only going to give you 80%. I'm reserving 20% to myself. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. I'm cashing in any time. Now, I don't know if there's a lady in your right mind that's going to take that deal. Or let's say, gentlemen, if you got down on one knee and proposed to your significant other and she looks at you and says, yes, I'll marry you, but I'm only going to give you 80% of my heart. 20% is reserved for me. I want to do what I want when I want. Cash it in whenever I can. And there's nothing you can do about it. I'm telling you right now, honest to goodness, if my wife, if, my, if Emily had told me that, I'm only going to give you 80%. Even if there had been a but, after she said yes, I said, I'm sorry, I can't go any further with this. Because if I can't have it all, I don't want any, any of it. Now, if we can understand that, why do we give just a little bit to God and not everything? We have to give everything to God. There are sacrifices that we have to make. And we look at, we look at the world in general and we say, well, sacrifices is an ugly word, isn't it? Because we don't like to give up things. We don't like to stop doing certain things. I can, I can tell you, and last time I was out here, I, I told you I had lost a little bit of weight from April, 20, April 20th to last Wednesday. I lost 63 pounds. And you know what I had to do to do that? I had to give up sugary drinks. I had to give up eating as many the dead. <laughs> I had to give up those things that's going to cause me to continue to maintain the heaviness that I've got. Now, I've still got a long way to go, but I'm on the right track. There are things that I had to sacrifice. There are th I have to push that plate away a little bit. Eat half my meal, so you know that's enough. That'll sustain me. I don't need it anymore. I trained my mind to do that. You see, when in regards to living this life and this, and this earth and, and how the world is, there are a lot of things that the world offers that we as human beings would consider fun. That we as human beings would consider entertainment. That we as humans would consider something that we would want to do. 
But we have to ask ourselves the question, at least are those things godly? Are they going to get us closer to heaven or push us further away? And quite frankly, if you're having to ask a question about it, y'all not do it to start with. If you're having to ponder it yourself, will God be pleased with this or will God be not pleased with this? That already answers your question, I think. That'll take a chance. But Jesus gave a sacrifice for us, and we also have to sacrifice for Him. Not only in service, not only in sacrifice, but there's a level of selflessness that we have to have in our life. Paul says in verse 21 of chapter 2 of Philippians, he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Paul also mentioned over there in, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, a man named Demas. A man named Demas, and he says, He has forsaken me, having loved the present world. Loving the things that the world has to offer. He says, Demas has left the ministry. Demas is pursuing those sins of the flesh that we read about. Demas has left me and forsaken, not just me, but he's forsaken God. He's forsaken Christ. He's forsaken the gospel. He has went into the world doing those things that is pleasurable to him. Sometimes we as Christians are guilty of that, aren't we? Because we think about ourselves. We think about what we like, what we want, what we desire. You see, there is a level of submitting to God that we have to overcome. And we have to get to that, across that threshold in order for us to be pleasing to God. Most like you see in Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, Wives, are to submit yourselves to your husbands. But it also says, it doesn't use the word submit, but it says, Husbands also love your wives. Guess what? The submitting goes both ways. We submit ourselves to our spouse. We submit ourselves to our husband. We submit ourselves to our wives. We submit ourselves to God. That means that we answer to something that is bigger and greater and more knowledgeable and more powerful than we are. And if we understand the power of the sovereign almighty God, understand that it's only Him that can, that can forgive us of our sins, understand that it's He that set the standard for us, why would we not want to submit to that? Why would we not want to follow the lead which He has provided for us? Going back to our jobs. Going back to our things that we do in our jobs. You know, there are a certain standards by which we are to perform in our job, are they not? You work in a, whether it's been in a factory, whether it's in fast food, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's in a medical field, there are standards by which that person, that individual, must about by in order to keep that job. Number one, you got to show up to work, right? Number one, you gotta, sometimes you, you're required to wear a uniform. Number three, you got things you have to do as far as a, a nurse, as far as a doctor, there are, are whatever it is, you have responsibilities that you have to complete on your job, regardless of what it is. And if you're lacking those things, if you're showing up late, if you're not obeying the rules and you're going, to, you're going out on left field doing your own thing and getting yourself hurt or somebody else hurt, guess what? Your supervisor's probably going to come to you and be like, hey, I'm giving you a chance to correct this. You might have a thing called a write-up. You might have a reprimand put on you. You might have something that you, have, you know you've got to change. And if you don't change it, guess what? You lose your job. Now again, if we can understand this, this, the concept of that being the standard of where we work and where we are employed, then how can we not understand the standard by which God sets for us? It's not up to us. It's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's up to God. And if we're going to be pleasing to God, we're going to submit ourselves to God, are we not? We're going to put aside those things that we are. Remember Paul, Paul talks about uh, in Romans chapter 6 how the that was rise to walk in newness of life. Had he told the church of Corinth that we are we that we are to put off the old man. And when we say put off the old man, that means the things that we used to like to do, if they're not godly, they're not part of our life anymore. Now you can be selfish if you want to. And you can hold on to those things if you want to. That's your choice. But God demands more of you than that. He demands more of me than that. 
It'd be real easy, as Gary mentioned earlier in the Bible study, it would be easy for me to make the choice to get up here and tell you something that's not true. If I wanted to, I had that choice. I would hope and pray that if I ever did that, somebody would know the Bible enough here to just come to me and say, hey, whoa, that's not correct. You can't say that. You can't preach that. You can't teach that. And worst case scenario, if I continue to be off in left field, you better get me out of the pulpit. Drag me out the front door. It's that serious to me. Because I don't ever want to say anything or do anything that's going to intentionally lead somebody astray. And I never would do that. Willingly. And if I was ever forced to do that, whatever the punishment was, if I didn't, I guess, guess I'd have to endure that. If I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to lie to you. There are things that I would like to do. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be entertaining? Wouldn't it be entertaining? Now again, I ain't saying it right. But wouldn't it be entertaining if we had if we had a rock band set up here and they would play? It'd be kind of entertaining, wouldn't it? You go to concerts. You entertain the other concerts, don't you? George Strait's going on tour again. Stadium tours. Him and Chris Stapleton and I thought, man, George will get enough in years. It'd be a good time to go see him before he, you know, retires or, or worse. And I looked on that thing, he was going to be at Nissan Stadium, and I said, hmm. Man, that's just in Nashville. We can make that. And I said, let's get so what what would it cost to sit on, on the field? Eight hundred and forty one dollars. Ah, I don't need to sit on the field. Let's go up in the next set next next section there. Six hundred and forty one dollars. Ah, it's still too close. Let's go to the, the middle range. Remember all the way up the purple range you see if you see the seating chart. No, that was still five hundred dollars. The cheapest ticket that I could find was a nosebleed section on the far end of the field, and it was $348. And I said, you know what? George Strait from there would look like an ant. <laughs> I might still hear it, but I would not be entertained. It would not mean near as much to me to know that I was there to experience that if I couldn't actually see him with my naked eye. And I'm not going to carry binoculars in there, because let's be honest, I mean, that's just... Crazy. Why would you do that? But uh, you see, you, you want to go to things like that. You, you want to experience things like that. But am I willing to sacrifice $841 of my time and my money to do that? No. No, I can buy a CD for 10 bucks. I can download it off iTunes for cheaper than that. You know, I can. He's right there in my ear pocket. I don't need to go see him. But friends, we have to understand that we, there are sacrifices that we have to make even though it looks good, even though it seems right, and even though it feels good, it may not be the best thing for us. And if we're, if we're practicing selflessness, that means we're not selfishly minded, and we are godly minded, do we understand what, that, what God asks of us? And we're willing to follow His lead. I know there are many examples that we could read about in Scripture of those who offer service unto God, those who offer sacrifice in their life to God and give up many things in order to serve. And I know we can go to many different examples of those who were selfless and gave of themselves and, and gave everything they had in order to preach and teach and follow those things are God. I wonder sometimes, granted this is a extreme moment, but I wonder sometimes if it was true that when, when you read the, the article all the way back in the years that uh, the Columbine massacre happened over in Columbine, Colorado. And how there was an article of an eye, or a comment that an eyewitness made of when he was in the room that the shooters were in and one of the young ladies lost their life and before he pulled the trigger he asked her the question, do you believe in God? And she said yes. And that was the last thing she said. And I wonder sometimes that if it come down to that, 
If it come down to that, if it come down to us losing everything, to gain everything, if we would have enough courage to stand up, if we would have enough courage to say yes, Satan's holding the barrel of our head every day. And he's asking you, and he's asking me each and every day, when those temptations come into our life, do you believe in God? And if we say yes, we put those temptations away. But sometimes we say no. And we grab a hold of it. And we separate ourselves from God. And you asked me the question this morning, way to sin here is death. Separation from God. I don't want that. Not for me and not for you. This morning you have an opportunity to become a Christian if you've not done that already. By putting on Christ, having the faith that you are here obviously says something about what you believe in. Being willing to repent of your sins, being willing to confess the name of Christ before men, then you are a candidate for baptism where you can go into the waters of baptism be buried with him in the likeness of his death, and being rise, risen in the likeness of his resurrection. The blood of Christ will touch you and wash away your sins through your obedience. And then we're told to remain faithful unto death, Revelation 2 and verse 10, and we'll receive that crown of righteousness and the crown of life that Paul talks about. And it could be that we're, that's where we're messing up. It could be that we're not making the choices that we need to make as Christians. It could be that our life is not a reflection of service, of selflessness, and of sacrifice. Friends, if you're in that situation, you can come forward after the prayer of those that are faithful, and you can be restored to the Lord to see in Galatians 6 and verse 1. And you can be brought back to a good standing once again in the family of God. And if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we beg, plead, and pray. We make it known right now while together we stand and while we sing.